Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Hannah Breckbill. I am one of the farmers at Humble Hands Harvest. Um, and we're in Decorah, Iowa. So zone 4B, um, a little colder than most of the rest of Iowa. Um, and um, we, we raise two acres of um, market vegetable crops. Um, so we um, mostly sell at farmer's market and we also have a CSA in our local community. So um, uh, selling almost everything um, that we raise in, in Decorah, Iowa. Um, and let's see. So the story of tarping on our farm is basically a story of our, our um, progress toward a no-till system um, on our farm and, and trying to figure out ways to um, manage weeds in our no-till system, in particular, how to manage um, perennial weeds. Um, our big weed is thistle. So I have this beautiful picture of our brassica field um, after it's been weeded. And this is brassicas before they're weeded <laughs> sometimes on our farm. So we we really have a thistle problem. Um, uh, so yeah, let me, let me start by talking about how we discovered tarping. We heard about tarping from some friends who had put yeah, tarp down. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We seem to be having some trouble with your uh, slides showing up uh, right now. Oh, really? it, yeah, it says that it's still loading. Oh, that's too uh, bad. Okay, so you can see that. Yes, we can see that. Great. Um, so we'll just we'll just look at the pictures this way. Um, so beautiful brassica field, and then this is what our thistle problem looks like um, if we if we aren't able to arrest them um, earlier. Um, one thing that's interesting about weeding thistles is that they're like pretty darn easy to weed at this stage. So it looks like way worse than it is. It doesn't actually take that long um, to just go through with your hands and and weed. Um, but it, it looks really ugly and it does, um, if the thistles do look like this for a long time, the the plants will not be happy that you're trying to grow. So um, yeah, a big a big reason that we started tarping was these thistles. Um, and we also, yeah, we had heard about some of our, our farmer friends in the area um, tarping um, in their tillage systems. Um, and we are really, um, uh, yeah, more interested in in using tarps as a way to not have to till in order to um, deal with our um, weeds and our residue um, from previous crops. So using tarping as a as a way to flip beds and to terminate um, both weeds and also cover crops. Um, so this is this is the first tarping event that we ever did. We we put one down um, prior to planting some squash and lettuce. Um, and we were, it's a silage tarp that we bought from a local farm store and we were super happy with the results. Um, the, the plants looked great. The thistles um, were definitely not dead, but they were, um, set back um, significantly and also the annual weeds that um, that were thinking about coming up the first flush was also stopped um, and so that was really great we and so we we put some had some rows oops of squash and some rows of um, lettuce in between the squash that we in theory harvested before the squash <laughs> got to them um, yeah, and um, but now I think our biggest question is how we can um, how we can incorporate tarping along with cover cropping um, because we do want to keep building soil organic matter um, using 
the sun that's um, hitting our farm. Um, and so we don't want to just endlessly have tarps on our field. Um, we, we would much rather have, yeah, have them be um, uh, there for like two weeks to do their job and then go. So our question, one of our biggest questions is how long do we need to leave a tarp on for it to um, achieve the results that we want of it or expect of it? Um, so this is, uh, this next picture is an example of us putting a tarp right over, um, I think it was buckwheat or like partially buckwheat and partially like garlic that we had harvested al already. So the, the weeds that were left over from that garlic, um, some of which were large, um, which you can kind of see with the tarp bulged out like that. Um, and, and so this was in kind of late July that we put this tarp on and then hoping that it would, um, it would, uh, kill all those crops. And so that we could, um, uh, in this wait until the spring and then plant into it. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, here's just another picture of that situation, which is, um, yeah, it it's kind of it's kind of like embarrassingly ugly or like rudimentary, <laughs> I would say, um, because yeah, it feels way different than a than a tillage system or even mowing. Um, we don't actually have the equipment to be able to mow our no-till beds, um, and. Uh, and so we're seeing, I guess, if if tarping will be adequate to um, to uh, stifle the the growth and kind of turn it into a mulch um, or not. Um, and yeah, I would say that the bottom line is that we're using tarping because it seems like. Uh, way to deal with a large swath of um, uh, a large piece of land at a time if we have the time to do it. Um, and the other option that we would have in this situation in our no-till bed is to just like come through with a wheel hoe and just get everything, um, which would be a lot of labor compared to just letting a tarp sit there for a few weeks. So. Um, yeah, I think that is the basics of my thing. And I'm ha really happy to answer any questions that you all have now about what we do on our farm and what we're learning. And I'll stop sharing my screen for the moment, but you can put your questions in the chat if you have them. I have a question for you, Hannah. Sure. Um, can you can you talk a little bit more more about the that sequence of events prior to planting or after that crop when you're first trialing it out and you're saying, you know, am I or am I not going to control thistle? I mean, so what what did it look like? How long? How did you did you prepare the beds to, to any degree? But, Prior to tarping them, did you put it over crop residue? Did you just did you? What did the management sequence look like? Yeah, so that that picture of the um, squash and and lettuce. Yeah, the management sequence there was that we had. Um, I'm almost sure that we had built no-till beds the year before. And for us, building a no-till bed means kind of digging out pathways and keeping them on. So there's a, a little bit of height difference between um, the pathway and the, the bed itself. And, um, and then uh, there would have been a crop in there the year before. I'm trying to think of what it would have been. Probably, probably some kind of um, root crop um and like beets or something um 
and then in the spring, I think we we let the spring kind of start and um, and you know it got wet and and stuff like that under there, and then we put the tarp on. Um, so weeds were starting to germinate, thistles were definitely starting to think about coming up, um, and we put the tarp on for a few weeks until it was time to plant squash. Um, so late May probably, um, and then we took everything off. And under there would have been a little bit of a little bit of re residue from the previous year, um, and a little bit of like dead dead annual weeds, and then these like white thistle things that were trying to grow. And so we would go through quickly with a hoe and get any of those thistles um, uh, killed, and then plant um, right into that. Um, and and planting in, involves for us um, adding a little layer of compost um, to the top of the bed. So that also serves as a little bit of an uh, mulch for uh, to prevent annual weeds from from coming up, um, which serves pretty well for annual weeds, but obviously not for thistles. Anna, there was a question in the chat about uh, if you could guess kind of the percentage of thistles killed in your three weeks of tarping. Um, yeah, I don't have a way to estimate that. My my theory or my thought is that the thistles actually don't die at all. <laughs> um, like they have these underground rhizomes, they're coming up in other places and they're still trying to come up under the tarp. Um, but, uh, but they're not getting any sunlight under there. So they're, um, they're kind of any energy that they invest under the tarp is is kind of squandered um and so they're um it just gives us a head start um so that once we take the tarp off and kill all the attempted thistles that are under there um they they take a while um to come back compared to the rest of the field and so that gives us a yeah a head start and there have been a couple questions uh, about your black tarp versus uh, the the one that wasn't black, and if you saw differences between those. Yeah, so those are definitely different experiences. So the black tarp is a silage tarp; it's black on one side and white on the other. And so we've had it; we've done it both ways, with black underneath or white underneath. Um, and we mostly like having black on top because it's less um, painful on the eyes <laughs> on a sunny day. Um, but there might be a, a good reason to have white on top. Um, and uh, and so the other one um, that you saw covering the kind of buckwheat um, zone was uh, was an old caterpillar tunnel plastic piece um, that um, that we used um, as a tarp um, after we retired it as a cat tunnel piece, and um, and so we were basically just trying it out to see if it would work. Um, in theory, I think solarization is the thing that you do with those clear tarps, and it's supposed to really heat up the soil underneath. But that only works if there's a really um, really um, sealed edge, I guess, to like really keep the heat in there. Um, so we notice we notice a lot of variability under the um, under the clear tarp where some places like purslane is able to survive through a lot of heat um, and and it has just enough air that we still have purslane under there after after a long time. Um, or, uh, yeah, but then other places under it are are totally dead and what we want from from a tarp. So I think for us, the silage tarp is is way better, and we only use that clear tarp because we happen to have it. Um, but and there was a, a question uh, asking, so what happened to that ugly tarping experiment on the July garlic patch? Yeah, I mean, it looks ugly, but then we 
after in this basically we had those tarps down all into the fall and then I think we cover cropped them with oats and peas or something like that those beds um which winter kill and then in the spring we had a very residue filled um several beds um that we planted into what do we plant um we planted our greens into them so some of the greens um, that we plant, we don't need to like really clear residue away. We just go um, transplant them right in. And then some of the greens that we plant are direct seeded. So we need to kind of hoe over the bed first or somehow clear the residue out so that we can plant. Um, uh, yeah, but it was it was totally, yeah, we're definitely learning in our no-till system to uh to like be happy to have residue around which is like really different than our than when we were tilling in the past like it's just nice to have a clean clean tilled bed um but yeah we're working with residue and and it's and it um it works all right thank you um a number of these questions uh, might be answered uh, in Ryan's uh, talk, so we'll we'll hold these uh, for now. Uh, and Ryan, if you want to share your screen, we can uh, go on to your section. Um, great, thank you for the invitation, uh, AMS, and uh, everyone else at Practical Farmers of Iowa. I um, am happy to join Hannah here. I actually, have uh, some some roots um, at in Ames, uh, where I went to graduate school in, uh, in the early 2000s or mid 2000s. So I have a lot of uh, fond memories of, of central Iowa, good friends there. And it's nice to make uh, a connection with practical farmers of Iowa again. Um, where I sit now is within the Cornell Small Farms Program um, based at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And uh, within the Cornell Small Farm Program, I, I um, have you uh, a technical and educational uh, role um, to basically support small to mid-sized farmers in, a, in adopting soil health practices on our farm. And this has very much come through uh, the lens of how do we uh, address um, um, pillage in uh, organic systems in recent years. And so I think, uh, uh, so I'm gonna share with you all some lessons learned basically through primarily uh, tarping uh, trials as, um, as I have seen them over the last uh, uh, nine years um, playing around with tarps in, in my own farm, which is an experimental research farm. Um, but also um, thinking and talking together with farmers in the Northeast and, and sharing some of their lessons learned. So I don't have uh, goals of, of tossing lots of data in front of you. My primary objective is just to throw out some uh, broad principles and ideas to stimulate discussion uh, based on my observations and experimental um, approach the last um, uh, nine years. And it started magical, I guess, I think, you know, it, it was like that this title is very uh, convenient because in much the same way that a farmer would just buy a tarp and put it down, we we kind of did that in one of in our first tarping trial. We had a space uh, in one of our experiments uh, where we were looking for a different management option to basically use little to no tillage, and we had just learned about tarping through a group of uh, experienced farmers uh, and longtime farmers in this, in the in the Northeast. So we threw it down, and from then on, we kind of just started running with it because. Farmers were asking lots of questions and we were seeing really interesting results. Now, uh, let's see if I can get these slides to advance. There we go. Um, I just want to summarize how I think about tarps. I think of them as a multifunctional tool, right? Which is uh, really important for small scale uh, and diversified vegetable farmers. You want to invest in, uh, in a tool that is. Uh, necessarily very specialized uh, to only do one thing, but to do many different things. And when we ask farmers uh, in the Northeast about how they look at tarps, 
um, several years ago, I think this was back in 2019, uh, we got all kinds of answers, which is kind of remarkable for, for a piece of plastic to, to basically reduce tillage, improve spring field access, pull beds, um, create, uh, manage weeds, kill weeds after crop harvest and, and all these kind of, so it's basically a soil meets uh, weed management tool. And that, um, to me, uh, that's one of the greatest advantages of, of using tarping is to basically fit it in the rotation to do, um, to do what you, uh, to, to fit a specific goal that you have in mind. And I think it has, there's a lot of opportunities uh, to use tarps for, for different objectives. And Hannah mentioned, um, mentioned several of them based on uh, her farm. But they also have logistical challenges. So every time I, we try to get a survey of farmers, what are their impressions of tarps? It's how multifunctional they are, all the different ways that they can use them, but how they're a royal headache to handle and deal with, right? <laughs> and I have uh, no uh, silver bullet answers to how to make tarps less of a, a logistical challenge, whether it's moving them across fields or managing the water that they pool on the, on the surface. Um, or just kind of getting wet and dirty as you're kind of dragging them around. I think there are ways to um, to find some efficiencies with them in the field, and uh, we can talk a little bit about that in the discussion, hopefully, as well as ways to kind of secure them uh, and from from wind. Um, but I don't think we've gotten around these logistical challenges. I think it's also amazing when I tour farms how. Tarps can be used in lots of different field applications. Um, uh, pictured, to, pictured here are lots of, lots of different uh, scales and times of year. You know, over winter, um, uh, a tarp that might be only 50 feet long. Um, then uh, on, a lar on a larger farm, that might stack two tarps, go 200 feet long and, uh, and uh, require a lot more sandbags. Uh, but um, Lots of different uh, ways and scales to use them, including in the high tunnel, where a lot of our labor is 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 um, hand hand based labor or manual labor. Um, a lot of the tarps um, are basically fit to the high tunnel in many ways. And then other farmers that are saying, you know, I don't I don't want to deal with this big old um, big old tarp. I'm just going to do a bed at a time and use kind of this woven landscape fabric. And I, I think there's a good number of folks. That are are starting to use this uh, as an alternative to plastic because it doesn't um, con, con water, and especially on a small scale with maybe a single farmer, it's easier to move around. So our two big questions that kind of were driving all of our trials and all of our our work with farmers is what is happening under tarps, basically. What is going on under there? What can we start to understand? I think we're only uh, actually scratching the surface to answer this question uh, because as you all know, soils are super, very complicated. <laughs> and um, there's tons of questions around the biology um, and cycling of nutrients, residue decomposition. And I think that, I think there's um, ways of manipulating that in different ways with or without tillage, with different soil amendments that could be interesting. But what are, we're just gonna scratch the surface here and talk about what, what, it, what do we see that's happening on our tarps through some of our trials? And the, the, over, the other question is, how do we use them to be successful with less tillage? Now, Hannah talked about using tarps to go no-till. I think there's a very large gradient in between there where we can use tarps to, um, in, in ways that basically uh, guide us towards using less tillage on the farm without necessarily um, having no-till as the end goal and still see positive results. A lot of our um, uh, results are informed by this long-term experiment uh, that we just finished up last year. This is based in uh, Freeville, New York, which is just outside of, of Ithaca. Um, uh, it is about an acre where over the last eight years, we've uh, been managing a, a permanent bed system and instituting uh, using tarps and tillage in different ways, growing a variety of crops to learn about the the short-term and then the long-term effects of these practices. So eight, uh, this is the trial where eight years ago, we said, well, we're gonna try uh, tarping without any tillage. And we threw a tarp down. And we, we basically maintained those beds 
in place with controlled traffic and foot traffic uh, over the last eight years in very much the same way that a farmer uh, would do that in, in, on their own farm. And I think that just this very concept of, of permanent beds is, is um, critical actually to basically manage compaction. Um, there's there's um, clearly an advantage to concentrating any traffic, foot traffic or wheel traffic outside of the planting bed year after year after year. And I, I would suggest that we were, would not have been able to maintain these beds in a no-till system without having that controlled traffic. So I think the permanent bed system and the ways in, that it, it's managed are, are kind of critical to, to this goal of using less tillage. So a lot of our work kind of comes out of this. Short term, like I said, like what happens before and after tarping to, okay, we started tarping eight years ago. Now what is, what's going on? What's the aggregate effect? And that's really what um, is missing a lot from agricultural field experiments is we, we go from one field to the other field and we might repeat it, but we go to a brand new conditions. Well, in this case, we are basically inheriting the legacy of our previous management year after year after year. Um, and we, this is a picture of lettuce. We've grown uh, in our rotations, we've grown uh, cabbage, and winter squash, lettuce, beets, um, broccoli, basically a mix of direct seeded and, and uh, uh, transplanted crops, as well as, um, shorter season crops like lettuce and then long season crops like winter squash is kind of, um, let's, let's just call them kind of indicator crops or just um, or ways to kind of uh, clearly not as diverse as a farm, but to get at different um, different aspects of, of, of this system through the lens of uh, different crop types, essentially. Uh, so I'm just going to hammer this point home again that we can think of tarps as a tillage tool. A lot of times that, that might just be making fewer passes. In this experiment, we have, uh, we've, we've maintained um, a, a series of beds that basically are tilled conventionally like we typically would. We just, we set the rototiller as deep as possible and we tarp and we keep it on for three weeks and pull it off and we plant. And in the meantime, in beds that haven't been tarped, oftentimes we have to do one, two more passes to get the bed ready to plant, uh, to kill weeds that um, have emerged or that haven't been killed with tillage. And, and we have effectively reduced our tillage through less, uh, less passes. You can also just simply take the rototiller and go shallower. Um, in, in this case, we, we often take, um, like let's say we're going eight inches, we adjust the rototiller so we go three to four inches and we make one pass. And we ask the tarp to take care of the rest. A lot of times that is taking care of the weeds that the rototiller is not, um, not terminating, right? So like if you were, term, if you were, you're not relying on tillage to bury those weeds, but you can ask the tarps to essentially provide that service, terminating those weeds, pull them off and plant. And of course, um, as Hannah said, they provide, I think, a, a brand new window to try no-till uh, without the application of like a mulch or a high residue system. You can actually try and implement no-till practices using tarps. Um, and um, as Hannah suggested, uh, I think that is um, trial and error processes um, that, that every farmer um, will kind of play with on their own. But that's, that's essentially what we've been able to do um, in this trial is to, uh, this long-term experiment is to maintain no-till beds for eight years, which we did not, um, did not believe was possible actually without a high residue system. Uh, but with tarps, it became possible. Um, one thing I also, um, so I just wanna just throw out some broad um, uh, lessons or let's, let's call them uh, wa ways of thinking about tarps. A lot of times we think about tarps as kind of shoulder season. You know, you can apply them in the spring or you can apply them in the fall or the winter. I think we can also apply them in the summer between crops for two to three weeks. I think finding opportunities uh, in crop rotation to, uh, to apply tarps is, um, is, would be really valuable, right? And so um, I, I think that it does require like a tarp plan, just like it requires a crop plan. Like, okay, here's my tarp and here's my crop and here's what I need to plant. And do I have enough time to have a tarp in that system? And to, to, to think through and, and, and lay it out and see where, where can I get a tarp in there after um, uh, Hannah provided an example of garlic. I mean, after gar we didn't grow garlic in our experiments, 
but after harvesting uh, harvesting garlic, laying the tarp down, prior, and then prior to uh, maybe a fall uh, seeded cover crop or some other fall crop, um, another opportunity. Anytime that you feel that the, the beds will be left unmanaged or, or um, potentially go to um, be bigger weed management problems. I have heard lots of farmers just saying, I just put a tarp on it because I can't get to it when I get to it. I, uh, that tarp is basically holding that for me uh, and, and, and providing me that, that peace of mind, basically. So think about different ways, um, um, other um, spring and, and um, fall, you know, are probably the easiest because they don't have that, uh, the pressures and, and the, and the, and the um, you know, early spring and late fall when, when things are really quieting down on the farm. But I think there's, um, there's good reason to find different, um, lots of different windows um, to apply tarps in the farm. I think tarps are a key tool to kind of manage your pre-plant pre -plant soil conditions, right? One thing that we know is that black plastic helps warm the soil, right? And so that, that, um, that's a reality with tarps. It's not gonna warm them as much as clear plastic, but we see tarps on average, like four to five degrees uh, increase compared to uh, untarped ground, right? Um, and that's gonna change, uh, you know, that's gonna uh, change the ways in which um, organisms in your soil behave. Um, and it's gonna, uh, and it's gonna essentially um, not necessarily provide warm conditions upon the time of planting, but you're going to inherit those conditions um, after the tarps come off. So that warmer, moist soil under the tarps uh, is, is inherited by the following, is inherited by the following. I think the water piece is huge too. When you put a tarp down, you're basically going to inherit whatever moisture conditions there were when you take, um, um, when, the, uh, when the tarp is applied. Basically, it's when we measure soil moisture under a tarp, you put the tarp down and it's essentially level, right? So it's pretty um, pretty useful in this. Maybe if you have a summer tarp application and you're maybe some farmers even irrigate or put or put some water down and then hold that, um, or maybe after a rain event, put the tarp down and then um, in midsummer when it's drier outside, a lot of that moisture is actually conserved. And we've heard of some farms having. Uh, having those uh, moist uh, soil conditions better for crop establishment in the dry times of year. The spring and the, uh, the spring is the big one from wet time of year, right? A lot of farmers that are applying them over winter. The reason being that those are the first fields that they want to get into, and those are the most, uh, and, and in some cases, dif very difficult to get into because of wet uh, waterlogged conditions. So having tarps on the ground um, kind of moderate that and make those fields available in spring when they wouldn't otherwise be. The other flip side of that is where's that water going? And in our field, a lot of sometimes that, that runs off and ponds up and it gets pretty nasty and ugly. So uh, I always um, recommend um, trying to direct that water as they come off or even when they're in place into perennial alleys and hopefully those can be established in the farm perennial crop, excuse me, sod alleys to then um, to kind of absorb that water as it comes off. Um, that's that's kind of the flip side of the water management issue. Um, when you when you combine soil uh, warm soils and regulated soil water, one of the big effects that we see under tarps is higher nitrate concentration. So this is plant available soil nitrogen that is elevated or increased after the tarps come off. Right, it could be a lot of times it's two to four times what uh, you would um, have in untarped ground. And so we've measured this um, in spring, in summer, and over winter. Uh, we've measured with and without tillage, and we get this, we get um, the same effect. This increase, we get a higher soil nitrate concentrations if you add tillage with tarping, uh, but just with tarping alone and no-till, you can increase soil nitrate concentrations. So the ideal is, is that the crop that you're establishing um, can take advantage of that extra nitrogen and, and get a head start for establishing. And hopefully um, that might mean in the future that tarps can provide you this nitrogen credit where you don't have to apply as much fertility because that nitrogen is available to the crop. But it's going to depend on the crop and, and, and hopefully it, it's there. It's not necessarily timed with uh, crop, pig crop demand, you know, the crop, you know, four weeks later or 
you know, in cabbage or four to six weeks later is when that crop is really taking off. So it's, it's but it might provide a good head start. And so that's um, one, uh, one big take home when we think about what's happening under tarps is this kind of change in the nitrogen cycling process. And the overwinter piece is really interesting. And I think that's, that has, uh, yes, something to do with warming soils and stimulating microbial activity, but also has to do with the fact that you have had these tarps down in November and December, January, right? when you have all this snow and, and melt and water leaching these mobile soil nutrients through um, um, and where they're essentially lost. So tarps in the absence of cover crops basically provide a way of holding those nutrients in place. Maybe it's even nutrients in crop residue that they're holding in place. So they, they can be kind of looked at as like this nitrogen conserving, uh, nitrogen conservation tool, right? Especially in that overwinter period where it's too late to get a cover crop in the ground. All this stuff adds up. This is the, um, for establishment, like I said, this is when we just use shallow tillage and we shallow till with tarp. We definitely see higher um, uh, um, stands. This is in beets, uh, improved stands by I think at least 50% in this case um, and gives those plants a head start. And hopefully it just, I mean, it might be just enough to give them a better start over the weeds, right? So that's um, one, one of the biggest things that I have seen early on uh, in the season is this kind of um, this improved crop establishment. Uh, this kind of cites back to Hannah's um, point about killing, uh, killing living weeds. Hands down, one of the biggest benefits that we found in this long-term trial is that when we have annual weeds in place, we can put a tarp down for three to four weeks and we can kill those annual weeds to plant without any tillage, right? And so that's kind of a tremendous opportunity. Um, to, to have basically a clean seedbed for planting that otherwise you would rely on tillage to accomplish that, that goal, right? And um, I, I wanna stress that these are annual weeds. Um, in this case, uh, at our farm, uh, we have a, a lot, in, especially in springtime, ahead of this lettuce, primarily it's uh, chickweed. Uh, I have found, and we have measured um, the, um, clear effectiveness of tarping in regulating chickweed and kind of giving us a, uh, a clear uh, bed for planting, no doubt, in, in spring. All this stuff has kind of added up over time too. That's kind of like the one time, oh, this is this like, lets us um, get into that field but um, for one year. But after um, seven years of continuous no-till management with the tarp, we went in and we actually sampled the weed seed bed. And so what we did was we took soil samples and we pulled the soils out of the field and we put them in a greenhouse. And we basically flushed these soils over and over again to kind of germinate the weeds in the greenhouse as a, an assessment of like what weeds are living in our soils in the form of seeds. And we, in this no-till tarp system, compared to just like conventional rototilling, we reduced our seed bank by 70%, which is kind of remarkable, which is really remarkable. Primarily through the, that those control of winter annual weeds, right? So in our case, primarily it's the chickweed, and I think that has a lot to do with our ability to have tarps down in times of year when those weeds would otherwise be thriving. Okay, I already talked about the shoulder seasons. We used, we used a lot of tarps over winter and in early spring, and that's when chickweed that's when chickweed thrives, and so we had the greatest effect on chickweed. Um, we talk a, a lot about this fatal germination under tarps, fatal uh, seed germination, where they kind of create these warm, moist conditions and, and the white thread weed comes up and the tarp, um, and the, the, because the tarp is black, it starves the plant from light and then they, they die, right? I think that that fatal germination is happening here, but I think that there's other things, other management that we're implementing that helps control chickweed. In, in one case, we're also having tarps down in times when chickweed is making seed. I mean, we have a lot of mature chickweed in these other plots. So if you're managing your farm with tarps and controlling the seed rain from mature weeds, that's another way that tarps can affect the seed bank, other than this more commonly uh, discussed topic of fatal germination. The other one is that with, with uh, in a no-till scenario, we're not bringing up no new weed seeds to the soil surface. And so by maintain, by using tar tarps to maintain uh, no-till, no those weeds that were um, either, 
that were germinating and dying, they're not being replenished from deeper soil depths in the same way that they're not being replenished from weeds raining down upon them. So I think there's lots of different factors that affect the seed bank here in the tarp system that also apply to, to your farms. The other, um, I'm gonna stress this point also that um, this is in, this is a, when we grew winter squash. You know, come early August, um, the tarps might give us a great start, but come early August, those plants are filling in and those, those, those fields are on their own, basically. We're not in there doing anything to control those weeds. They're up, they're up to their own defenses, <laughs> shading weeds or whatever our management prior was. And what we, we generally find is that we're not going to get the same season-long weed suppression that you would with the mulch. Okay, with the tarp. And so we, we've generally found that mulches provide that, in this case, it's a, it's a rye mulch. We, we basically harvest rye in late, late May, early June. It doesn't have any um, volunteer rye. We, we want to find a, a clean mulch. And we, we apply that to the winter squash. And we are definitely going to see a better season long weed suppression, primarily for those weeds that are germinating in the summer that when the tarps are not down. And in our case, that's hairy gallon soga. So in that same seed bank trial, we found that hairy gallon soga, our primary summer annual weed, wasn't really controlled with tarps because tarps are rarely down. But the, the benefit was in that summer annual weed was primarily provided by mulches because mulches suppress those weeds at times of year when those weeds are emerging and control those weeds from getting bigger and making new seeds. So this is one example of this idea of like, yes, tarp for establishment, but mulches for season long suppression. And these should be stacked with other practices. Uh, Hannah, you talked about this. We don't have any thistle, but we have uh, um, yellow nutsedge and quack grass um, on, the, on the edges, basically, of our trial. We didn't start our trial in a field that had bad quack grass and nutsedge problems. I think if we selected a field that did not have these problems before we move, move towards reduced or no-till. Um, so we basically, um, we saw these on the edge, but they, they were never like an existing problem. I think if, if we have perennial weeds in a field, I would, I would lean towards trying to design strategies to like really get a hold of those perennial weeds before I would go in a no-till direction. But the best way that we were to control these is basically just harp them to kind of weaken them in the same way that Hannah described, and then um, hoe them out and, and, if, and keep them from becoming bigger problems. Um, I want to speak just quickly about the addition of tarps with cover crops. Hannah, you talked about oats, oats and peas. We've done a bunch of work where we basically throw tarps over top of, of, of those cover crops. And um, you know, to the left here, you see at, you know mid-November, uh, a, a really nice stand of, of cover crop oats where we've mowed it. And then um, we're, we're planning to pl uh, come in there mid-May and plant uh, any series of crops. Um, and one of the things that we will observe is we come in and if we don't have a tarp, we basically have chickweed throughout the, throughout the plots, All right? So this is this, this uh, winter annual weed that's establishing itself. And by the time we're ready to plant, uh, that cover crop hasn't provided really the, the mulch that's appropriate, that's necessary in order to suppress that chickweed. And it's probably underneath of all those oats too. It germinated at the same time we planted the oats. And so by adding a tarp over top of it, we have suppressed that living weed. And this matrix that you see on the right is us applying tarps in certain areas and not in others. And you can see this kind of chickweed path that's kind of navigated around. In this experiment, we trial tarping at uh, different times. We, we like after mowing that, win that winter, we put it down over winter. We put it down um, six weeks prior to planting and three weeks prior to planting. Um, and then we didn't apply it. And then we didn't apply them at all. And we compared the effect of, of tarp duration basically on, um, on the establishment of, uh, on the soil and the establishment of beets in this case. And one thing that I uh, struck me was that Tarps, in this case, essentially served as a residue decomposing or as a residue preserver. We found no effect of, of the tarp 
on residue decomposition. It, it almost, it to some degree looked like it preserved it because the light wasn't, you know, sunshine wasn't acting on it. And, and that's actually where you see the darker colored, these darker colored uh, oat residue. That's from the longer duration tarp that wasn't ex exposed to any, any sunlight. But we had higher nitrate concentrations. We had better, um, we had uh, better weed control and we could plant into this. And Hannah said she scraped the surface out of, of the residue out of the way and planted uh, directly into it. We've tried out different ways of, of planting straight into this residue. It depends on the equipment that you have. So um, I think that the, you know, it's always hard to you know, plant a cover crop in our case in, in mid August, right? But um, this, is, this, is, this is the, the reality with oats. Um, but I think that, but if we do have it and you add a tarp over top of it, I think that there's some added benefits. Um, I also wanted to speak briefly to this idea of winter hardy cover crops, in this case, cereal rye. I think tarps are kind of a game changer for managing cereal rye because now we can terminate cereal rye without any tillage. And a lot of times we're not establishing cover crops until, you know, late October. Um, and, you know, you, you can get a cover crop, you can plant cereal rye around here at that time. You're not going to get maximum biomass. You're not going to have it growing up to your shoulders <laughs> uh, when you plant that late. But, um, but you can have a cover crop in the ground and then you can use tillage, you can use tarps to terminate it when you desire based on the crop that you're going into. In this case, we worked with a farmer in our area that was interested in trialing it in uh, potatoes actually. So he established uh, this cereal rye cover crop the previous fall. He, um, he took his walk behind um, uh, BCS tractor and, and made uh, kind of strip um, furrows, hot potatoes in the ground, uh, covered them up, and then, um, and then uh, four or five weeks later, he had actually added a, um, a hay mulch on top. And so that's, that's what you see all the way on the right. But that, um, the use of a tarp to terminate the winter rye was a, was a big add for him. Um, um, otherwise that rye is gonna be growing up um, throughout, throughout the mulch in some cases. Um, it also is, you know, when he applied it, he terminated it at a time that the rye was not necessarily taking up all that soil and sometimes, especially in dry years, rye can start to really soak up, take up soil, uh, soil nitrogen and, and tie it up for the following crop. But by tarping over top of it, um, he held that, he basically held that in place. It wasn't taken up into the crop and then he had higher nitrate concentrations or uh, soil nitrate concentrations for the crop as he was planting into it. That was a pretty interesting application but I think that there's lots of applications that will probably talk about this idea of growing rye as a mulch and then tarping over top of it, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. We can use tarps um, to kill rye at other times as well and just have more cover crops in the field. Just one or two more slides and then I'll open it up. Um, this, this, I want to hammer home but this point about tarping and other soil health uh, management practices. Um, after eight years, of managing with conventional deep tillage side by side with no till and tarping. We went in there and we did the Cornell soil health test, which um, you might have an equivalent that you uh, take advantage of in, um, in your area. But we wanted to look at some physical and biological properties to understand how these kind of long, how this management added up over time. So what we, um, I just chose two of those properties to show you here. One is aggregate stability and the other is soil respiration. So aggregate stability is basically just the, the, the ability of those soil particles to hold together, to form glues and to make um, good, structure, good structure. And one, uh, one of the take homes in this, um, from, this uh, from this trial was that when you add, um, you can, you can look at this and, and notice that in deep tillage and no-till without a mulch, we basically have close to the same aggregate stability. But when you add a mulch in both of those systems, that's where you add the added benefit in aggregate stability, especially when you add the mulch with no-till. So the mulch in, in many effects was more important than tillage in providing that, that soil health benefit and in providing that better soil structure. 
Of course, tillage has its own benefits, but the mulch was really driving uh, that, so that, that change. And the same can be said in soil respiration, which is just one measure of biological activity in the soil. Um, interestingly, in a deep tilt, convectionally tilled system for eight years, um, compared to a no-till system with tarping and no mulch, we basically had the same level of soil respiration, right? Uh, but when you add a mulch on that, that's where we saw that biological benefit, basically. So I, I'm kind of uh, blown away by that, that importance of, of adding uh, those other, and our ability to actually measure it in this case, those uh, stacking these different soil management um, uh, uh, tools, right? No-till, tarping, and mulching to get the biggest benefit in our soils. It's not always just about the tarp, it's about what we add with the tarp and that organic matter that's gonna provide the biggest benefit. I just wanted to point out that we do through the Cornell Small Farms Program, host a, uh, a bunch of tarping resources. Um, you can find them um, through Cornell Small Farms slash Reduced Tillage. And there will be links to uh, various articles that we've written through the Cornell Small, uh, Small Farms Quarterly, including an article about that potato trial that we did on farm, to um, the guide um, that we produced in the Northeast called Tharping the North Northeast, a guide for small farms. Um, there's also links to some YouTube um, um, YouTube videos where we did uh, tarping webinars with farmers in our area, uh, much like this. And you'll hear experiences, practical experiences about how, to, how folks are using tarps in different applications from succession plantings to cover cropping. With that, I'm just going to open it up. Um, I just wanted to honor the folks that I've been working with to do this over the last um, almost 10 years. And... Um, and very much a partnership between uh, Cornell University and the University of Maine and um, through, through multiple funding sources. And I'm looking forward to questions that have emerged and, and any uh, conversation that we can have in the remaining half an hour. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, before we uh, start asking questions from the chat, I just wanna uh, see Hannah, do you have any uh, questions top of mind for Ryan? Um, yeah, yeah, thanks so much. That was a really fun presentation to see. And I'm really inspired by how mulch makes such a huge difference <laughs> in, in those soil health things. Um, yeah, that was that was a fun graph to see. Um, and so I, I guess some questions that are that have come up in the chat and also are on my mind are about the like, practicalities of using a tarp um, and and like how many sandbags do you need and um and also wondering about rodents um in terms of crop quality basically and if I'm creating this habitat for um for rodents in my field am I yeah am I shooting myself in the foot in terms of my all of my squash are going to get bit um by them and so I I wonder um, if you have any any initial thoughts about those kinds of things. Yeah, definitely. As far as the logistics, um, I, I, I'm, I totally resonate with comments about, you know, about tarps ending up in the wind, uh, in wind breaks and just kind of blowing outside and it's like, oh my gosh, these are a real headache to handle. Um, I don't live on the research farm, right? And so... <laughs> I can apply a tarp in November and come back, uh, you know, maybe even the snow melts in January and say, oh my gosh, uh, this didn't really work. And they're like all over the place. And then trying to adjust them in the winter is just a royal pain. So uh, for that reason, uh, I'm a huge fan of applying more sandbags than less <laughs> and just, um, and not being shy about them. I have packed um, uh, sandbags with, uh, we're also, I didn't mention, we have pretty gravelly soils. Um, uh, we have lots of rocks, rock picks or rock picker go through and you fill rock bags. I know some farmers will fill rock bags. I'm a bigger fan of sand. Uh, I just buy sand and fill them up. They're easier to stack and they're lighter. Uh, the bags won't bust open. And I would just invest in a big pile of sand, put it in the back of the pickup truck, fill the bags and stack them up on pallets and hopefully move them around on pallets that way. I have the luxury of being able to do that with a tractor, um, moving, moving them around. 
And then when I have this pile of 40 or 50 sandbags on a pallet, um, I generally take two steps, which is like five to six feet for, for me, and I drop a sandbag and uh, along all the edges. So for every, um, so every five, every five feet down the row, all across all sides. And as you mentioned, Hannah, um, you, you have raised kind of raised beds. I also like to put them in the pathways. Uh, I'm sure a lot of farmers do that as well. Those that basically creates a little bit more of a of a seal over top of the bed and can help from um, wind coming up and kind of billowing in the in the middle. I put sandbags over top of holes because of course there's going to be some holes. I oh there's an extra there's a big tear over there. I throw a bag down over there. Uh, very generous with bags. Um, so uh, I in total. I'd have to do the quick, I have to do the math, but um, all the way around the perimeter, five, six feet, and and probably every 10 feet in pathways. In our case, we're managing like uh, 24 by 24 by 100 tarps, basically. So that that means like my I, my beds on center are six feet. So I actually have two pathways in between the bed edges where I also have uh, sandbags going down, and I think that really helps a lot. I saw in the comments somebody has. Bury the edges. I know some farmers that'll bury the edges just because it's worth it to them. It's it's a little bit more work, but if they don't, have, if they're on a wind prone site, they'll bury bury the edges. I haven't found uh, to just throwing some rocks on it to be enough, um, just loose rocks. But I know people will throw like the kitchen sink on there to keep it down, whatever whatever you can find. So I think um, I think as many sandbags as you can around the perimeter through the pathways. Um, and um, probably not prior, probably not putting them on the windiest site, windiest parts of your farm, especially over winter. Um, so I've made that decision on the student farm here. I was like, well, what are we gonna, where are we gonna put this? Well, this is like the most exposed hillside and I can't get here very often. And why am I going to put a tarp here? I'm actually gonna put on a sewer or a cover crop instead, you know? <laughs> so they're just finding the places that, that make the most sense. Uh, logistic wise, um, that's been uh, some of my take homes. I, I found that I used to store them in the barn. Tarps in the barn uh, generally get eaten by mice. So I put them on, a, I also put tarps on a pallet and I put them under cover like outside the farm shop or something like that. I, I have, oh, uh, I, know, I know more holes in tarps from deer or mice than anything else, right? And so uh, deer walking over top of them or, um, or mice in the barn, so I try to um, try to mitigate that by just not putting them in the places where the mice generally love to live. Mm -hmm. um, that those are some logistic thing, logistic question uh, pieces. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, on the topic of holes, uh, there have been a question or two about uh, repairing uh, holes and tarps, and is there a method to do that? I've never repaired the holes. Um, I've always lived with a lot of holes if they come as they come up and if they get really big then I put a bag on it so they stop tearing um I I have used um I actually haven't used silage tarps I've used um six mil black on black plastic basically what whatever you can find right we this is something I could find at my um local um tractor supply uh, uh tractor supplier equipment dealer basically and they had black on black six mil on there they're pretty tough. They didn't. They don't stretch as much. Like I know. I think there's a lot of differences in tarp quality. Like sometimes you just get a a, a silo tarp and you you know you just like they would over a bunker. You know you stretch them and they they like that shouldn't have happened. You know. <laughs> so, so I I like six mil uh, and just as durable as possible to mitigate the holes and and uh, yeah and covering them with bags and eventually. Um, in this trial, I, I think I saw this in, in there as a question. We use the same tarps for eight years. And at the end of this trial, I said to myself, okay, this tarp is done. It's got, a, it's got more than enough. Uh, these holes are kind of too big. It's not worth it. But that's pretty good for longevity for, um, to use the same tarp for eight years. And I think that kind of five, six year time frame is maybe pretty common. Uh, that would be my goal. Mm -hmm. Um, what I was just, your other point there, though? Oh, rodents. Yeah, in the yeah. field, I hear about that a lot. So um, some of our work was um, uh, funded through Northeast SARE, and we just we worked with a lot of farmers over the last 
here in the Northeast um, through that project and over the, um, doing lots of workshops and, and, and doing things. And, and I tried to survey these farmers every year and about, hey, what's happening in your farm? You know, with tarping, are you doing things differently? And one of the biggest complaints other than logistics are like, I think I have more whole mice. I think I have more bowls now or what I, they're a pain. So, and the only, the only suggestion that other farmers said is get a dog <laughs> or, um, or um, yeah, um, I think it's a, I think it is a, a emerging problem. I used to think that it was just in those like high residue like environments. You know, if you have the straw mulch or hay mulch and you have a tarp, that's like, that's a beautiful home, right? So I was like, well, maybe it's just in the high residue situations, but it doesn't seem to be um, the, um, isolated to that. But I, I would expect them to be more there. So I guess, uh, you know, when it comes to crop quality and damage, um, you know, uh, thinking about where, you know, places on the farm where you're tarping and not, you um, and not planting beets or root crops next to those. I mean, I'd be interested in knowing what crops you've had the most damage in and how you've been able to, to handle that, Anna. Yeah, yeah, in terms of rodent damage, definitely tops of beets and carrots sometimes happen on our farm, especially when there's um, kind of more density of residue or planting or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then, We've had like basically entire squash crops that like the squash is beautiful and perfect and every single squash has some nibbles out of it. And mm -hmm. that sucks. Um, uh, it's still perfectly edible, but it's not as valuable to the customer. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so still still figuring out that rodent. I think I think folks are still figuring that one out. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it would be interesting to say, like, it might be an argument for, um, yeah, um, yeah, thinking more about the crop plan. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, other than that, you know, uh, you know, dog control has been, dogs are the only, um, only thing that I've heard of people actually being able to do that says that, that helps. Mm -hmm. We did have a kitten this spring that um, we like helped her catch her first mouse by pulling a tarp away and all these <laughs> flew and then she got her yeah. first mouse. It was very exciting. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I have a thing to say, uh, just one tip. My co-farmer was ordering sandbags and she got orange sandbags so that mm -hmm. we could see them. Um, and that was very fun and I highly recommend that um because the wow. like gray sandbag on black plastic sometimes we've accidentally rolled rolled sandbags into our tarp storage situation and they get really heavy um another thing just about um that I I realized in sharing thinking about succession planting and that kind of thing and how to how to incorporate tarps what we've done and I'd be curious if you know other other ways people have done it. What we've done is we, in our brassicas, for example, which we are planting pretty frequently throughout summer, um, mm -hmm. we're planting different various brassicas. And we um, we have like a tarp over five beds or something like that. And then as, as we need that bed space, we kind of pull the tarp back um, and plant plan our next bed or two and sometimes we even drag the whole tarp over the next five beds or whatever um when we're when we're ready so that's how we've we've done it and then so sometimes at at least at the end of the season sometimes we're ended up where we have this tarp that's like five beds wide but we've actually pulled it up to, to where it's only covering one bed and then we finally take it out and plant that last bed or whatever so yeah I'd be curious what other people do um uh, that's really, I think that's the slickest application for sure is like this idea of succession plantings because you're peeling it back over time and then you're, uh, um, you're not move every time, you know, moving it somewhere else. But so you have the luxury of doing that. It might mean that you have, if you wanted to tarp some other part of your farm, you just buy another tarp. Like, so mm -hmm. I think that managing the logistics, like in some cases means having more tarps so you don't have to move them around as much and you have the, uh, the luxury of just like peeling it back and not using every square inch of the tarp every time it's, you're using it because it's effectively being folded back onto itself. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, as you as you mentioned. I've heard the same thing with um, with uh, lettuce successions for sure. And in one of those um, um, uh, farm webinars, we we uh, posted through small farms. Uh, a farmer uh, discussed that system. Um, so. I yeah I think that I think that's the the solution to a lot of the logistical challenges and it also speaks to the the um the um uh, crop planning maybe a little bit you know as far as like okay I'm gonna have tarp there and so just thinking about where the tarp is going to be is helpful even before you plant before you go into the season um I think the only challenge I and mean, sometimes one of the biggest challenges for weeds for me is when a tarp is there for a very long time. And, so, and because on the edge where the tarp meets untarped ground, it's like, uh, okay, how am I gonna get that? And I gotta like kind of move the tarp out of the way and hoe that. And so the only trade-off with what you're describing is that like you're leaving it there for a long time. And so you just have to manage the edges a lot, of, a lot more, be mm -hmm. conscious of the edges. I feel like sometimes that can be one of the biggest uh, weed challenges once you, start to get control of weeds in the beds. Okay, now I'm uh, trying to figure out how to manage the weeds where tarp meets bare ground. Yep, yeah, we've definitely had that challenge. We usually mm -hmm. are like mowing on the edges. So we're, we like pull the tarp back a few feet and just mow the edge and then put it back or whatever. Right, yeah. So it's some kind of like tarp dance there where you're kind of yep. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. The other thing that I'm thinking about to talk about is, is the, the pooling of water. Cause you know, our beds are raised. So we have these pools like all, all along the, the pathways in between the beds um, that are stuck on the tarp. And then when you're, when you're ready to like move the tarp, like if it's over our squash and we just need to take the whole thing off, um, mm. it, that just turns into a lot of, of like heavy work. Um, yeah. And uh, I guess I'll say that what I've figured out to do is to think of myself as not trying to move the water at all, but trying to move the tarp out from under the water. <laughs> and so then I just love pulling one bed at a, one like pathway at a time. I'm just pulling the tarp out from under it and then the water goes down. So but, the water is actually being directed like into your pathways. And that's yep. Right. Yeah. Which is like, whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it, i mean those pathways can especially in our case they're compact they're more compacted because they're mm -hmm. permanent uh pathways so they they can become a, a channel for that water um yeah i've tried to think about ways of kind of rolling it you know rolling it off and directing that water in some way down slope we don't have very slope ground at, at our mm -hmm. farm but um any way to kind of direct it outside of the beds is um is a solution if, if at all possible um i i mean there's been some times where you want to pull the tarp off and there's just so much water you're like really is this the best time to do this and it, it's just, uh, yeah. the timing is not not always great and sometimes it's totally dry and there's nothing there mm -hmm. and you're just off off and running i, I really think that's one of the biggest issues uh, with folks why they decide to use the woven path, woven stuff instead. Okay. I've heard of all of people function holes in their tarp strategically, right? So that the water actually drains through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and but if you do have stuff. if you do have puddles, you can grow a really nice crop of tadpoles and frogs and stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean the ponding water definitely helps hold them down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's the benefit of it. But I, I think that you know it it's, it's definitely an issue when you want to take them off. I think I heard something about compaction when it comes to tarping, especially in our long-term trial. Do you witness compaction in your fields from tarping? We haven't really, um, but also we're very high residue. Um, so mm -hmm. that um, I think mitigates any that might happen, but mm -hmm. yeah, I haven't really noticed that. People do talk about it like, oh yeah, the soil's harder. And I suppose the surface is definitely not as friable as it would be if it had just been tilled, but right. I haven't noticed compaction. Yeah, in our case, I feel like uh, in that long-term no-till tarping system, the ground is definitely um, 
definitely harder. I think it has less to do with tarping and more to do that we haven't done any tillage at all. Mm -hmm. um, um, when we do some tillage and tarping, I kind of actually like it better from a soil physical standpoint because it adds a little uh, firmness to it. It's like a moist, warm, moist, a little bit firmer soil condition than something that's tilled without a tarp. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that's one of the biggest reasons that we have good establishment. Um, I talked about it from nitrate or moisture or whatever perspective, but that like better seed to soil contact and till ground by just having a little bit of moisture and that tarp over top of it for, for a couple of weeks has, uh, I think, fir firms it, firms it up, doesn't compact it. But firms it up. I think the big uh, question would, um, uh, or the, bi the big thing for us is that we're not using any tillage and that's why it's harder. There's no doubt it's harder to plant into the till ground compared sure. to the ground. And it takes more time to do that. Um, cedars run through um, relatively um, good, actually surprisingly good. Or again, rocky ground. It might be different uh, if you have uh, high clay soils, though. And, and when you add tarps over the top, we're we're pretty loamy, so we, we don't see a lot of uh, tarp induced compaction. There were a couple questions along the vein of. Uh, timing. So what's the earliest time of year you have applied a tarp to be effective and how long do you apply it? And then uh, kind of going off of that, uh, when it comes to how long to keep the tarp down, do you consider time in terms of days, weeks, or thermal time, uh, growing degree days, for instance? That is a great question. Um, I have for the earliest fields, we have applied tarps over winter. So that means tarps are applied in, in our case, you know, maybe after this uh, oak cover crop or something like that, and, you know, mid November, or mid late November, you can put it, you know, as long as it's not snowing on the ground, you put them on when it works to, to get them down. So that's kind of the earliest, which would be the, 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 pre the end of the previous season. Um, and uh, otherwise, if I, if I say have a cover crop in the ground that I like, maybe it's uh, Sierra rye or if it's bare ground and you know, I don't want, uh, I don't want to apply it over winter, you know, some crops just doesn't fit. Then I put them on spring, uh, generally three weeks prior to the target planting uh, date, right? So if I'm planting on May, I think the earliest we've probably planted is like first, second, maybe second week of May, right? So like I'm, and here we can have snow in early April, right? So snow's off and I would put the tarp down for three weeks and plant in early to mid-May. Um, if you, you could, I mean, you could go out in March if there is a period of time, like right now in New York, there's no snow and it's 60 degrees. You know, I could go out and apply a tarp right now and it could be down for six weeks or eight weeks prior to, prior to planting. Um, but and um, the question, not as sophisticated around growing degree days, but it could be there at some point. Uh, if we wanted to get really tarp, uh, really into tarp timing, we, we could calculate that for different weeds. We could calculate that potentially for uh, soil nitrogen benefits or things like that. Um, I generally found that uh, we definitely add some soil degree units in the springtime. Uh, so if I measure soil warming over a tarp period, um, I, you know, even in that generally mid-March around here, maybe late March into um, or it, through April is when tarps start to, uh, to add that soil, soil warming Effect. You know, sometimes it's any other time earlier than that, it's just too cold regardless. And so um, you might get, um, you, we might be able to create some ways of thinking about um, soil warming under a tarp and say, okay, we've had enough, we've had enough of that, but I think we need to do more to, to standardize that, uh, to come up with the, the, cal the, the equations essentially for that to, as a predictor. But I, I would say mid, uh, mid, late March into, um, you know, planting by late April, early May is is our primary uh, window for a, a tarp that is not applied over winter for a spring crop. And we can get better, better more benefit or a higher 
probably, uh, we could kill living weeds. In this case, one of, you gotta think about what you're trying to do. If we're trying to just kill weeds, I think we can do it in a shorter time period in the middle of the summer. You'll probably do it in two weeks or, or less, right? So in our case, we're going from lettuce to, to a fall broccoli crop and we're putting a tarp over top of residues and weeds that are growing in the lettuce and they're generally dead after, uh, after two weeks, these uh, annual weeds. Uh, but then you'd, so you'd have a different uh, timeline uh, according to the, uh, yeah, according to the season, that's the, as the question is asked. Uh, one, one commenter said that they had to leave their tarps on for uh, an entire year in order to kill all the Canada thistle and quack grass, and they're concerned if there were any negative effects to the soil biology from doing that. I'd be curious to know if it worked. Because <laughs> I've heard of folks doing it for a year and then, you know, uh, perennial weeds are really good at just kind of hybrid. Um, I would, I was, if I were to do a, a trial with perennial weeds, I would try like different approaches to tarping with or without tillage in between, intermediate in between. So like maybe it's a one tillage, you pull the tarp back, you do one tillage back to try to set it back and then you put the tarp back down versus leaving the tarp on the whole season. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what the best control for perennial weeds is. You might be able to do it in less time if you actually use some tillage to kind of interrupt the growth cycle of that weed a little bit more, or at least stimulate it, leave the tarp off for a little bit, let it start to grow and then till it and tarp again or something like that. So some kind of combination of the two. I think the biggest, I. I think when it comes to the soil piece, I think it, it's, as I, uh, as I shared, I think it's all gonna come back to the, um, the way in which you manage your, um, their soil organic matter and, and the residues that you have under there, whether, I mean, so um, the little bit of data that I have seen uh, when it comes to like soil organisms around there, I've suggested that tarps, potentially could reduce them, uh, their, their abundance or diversity in the short term, but that, that they would come back in the long term, right? In the same way that they find that with clear and sorrhized so tarps. It's not as warm under black plastic. Um, I, so I, I, would, I would suggest that uh, not necessarily due to tarping, but maybe um, based on, uh, it's gonna be more related to what the, if it's bare soil, which left like as is, um, without any organic matter additions, then it probably is gonna be depleted um, because it just hasn't had any, it hasn't had any food sources uh, for, for, those, for those organisms to work with, uh, more so than the tarps themselves. We are looking at soil mesofauna. I was hoping to have that data, but we're looking at all the little critter, all the little arthropods under tarps. We, we measured them three times during this growing season. And I was hoping to have some of that to share, but trying to get into uh, some of those indicators of, of biology, um, the more we have done this. And clearly it's like one of the biggest questions is how do tarps affect soil biology? And hope to have some of those results uh, this spring. There are a couple of crop specific questions. Uh, one for carrots directly seeded. Uh, their goal is to get carrots growing before weeds take over. What kind of timing for when to apply the tarp for best weed suppression? how long to keep the tarp on. Uh, they're thinking spring crop, but uh, maybe would it be better for fall carrots? Um, I, think you could, I think you could do it for, for both, um, no doubt, spring or, or fall carrots. I know folks that, um, that rely on it. Uh, it depends on your rotation, but where that opportunity is in the fall. Um, I know folks that have planted um, uh, after planted carrots after tarping various times of the year. And my general rule of thumb is, um, is somewhere between three to four weeks prior to, prior to planting, right? And so um, if you're planting carrots with, uh, um, if, if, this, if you're using it in a tillage based system, do that tillage prior to tarping so that uh, when you pull off the tarp, you're not introducing you're not, you don't, you know, you don't need to do any uh, additional soil prep, or if you do, it's extremely shallow to not introduce new weed seeds to the soil surface, pull the tarp off and plant um, 
plant directly into it. I know some that have tried and have thought that maybe um, it wasn't enough time after three weeks, so um, or they might see some white thread weeds. I mean, you could combine tarps with um, with uh, with other practices too, like flame weighting, uh, if that is. Uh, I think that would be an interesting approach in those crops that are highly sensitive to weed, weed competition. But generally, no soil disturbance after tarping. Tarp for three, um, three to four weeks, and plant and go in, in direct seeded crops. It, um, my, we we didn't grow carrots, but we grew beets uh, in most of our uh, direct seeded crop trials, and, and we were highly successful. Do you have experiences, Hannah, in carrots? Yeah, I mean a little bit. Uh, yes, I would say we've tarped in spring for crop for any various kinds of crops, and we've tarped in in summer for fall seedings of carrots and that kind of thing. Um, the thing that I'm thinking about, what we we've been trying to figure out how to how to get um, good seed to soil contact in direct seeding in our no-till systems and. Um, yeah, so we're kind of, uh, my co-farmer is the main one who who does the seeding and she hates using seeders. So she actually just hoes furrows and seeds by hand. That's the way, that's the way we do it on our farm. And, um, and we apply a, a compost, this little layer of compost um, at planting for most of our crops. And so we did, we did this experiment <laughs> a couple of years ago where we um, we tried applying the compost first and then making the furrows and then covering and uh, planting seeds, covering them back up, um, that kind of normal expected method. And then we tried where we made the furrows in the bed and then applied compost over top of those mm -hmm. um, and didn't didn't touch it again, didn't like cover up things or anything like that. Um, cover up the furrows. And that actually had like significantly better germination, um, mm. which was surprising to me. But um, so that's how we do it now. We we mm. make furrows in our bed, we plant the seeds, and then we compost over the top. Um, so that's just. And you're hand hoeing, right? In the season, right? You're not relying on tarps alone for a week. For oh, no. yeah. I think that would be the thing that I would also emphasize is that, you know, in our trials, we also, you know, we, we do hand, we do hand weeding, I mean, with hose quick, you know, stir a hose down in between the rows and things like that. And so I think, uh, I think if we just left it for the tarps alone, yeah, we're, we're still going to have weeds. Actually, we did a trial where we basically did that. We just said, okay, we'll pull these off and see what germinates. And eventually, yeah, those weeds will germinate. But it, in a lot of ways, I think, um, especially in, if you have a really heavy or a high seed bank, you can't expect to have clean carrots with just a tarp. I, I would say tarp could help you get a, a good start, hopefully get those carrots off to a good start, differentiate the, the weeds uh, from the carrots and still plant to, to hoe, hopefully not as much and hopefully with less, less time invested in it. And that would be a good starting place. Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, thank you again to Hannah and Ryan uh, for this wonderful conversation and to everyone uh, who joined us. I appreciate all of your uh, comments and questions and I hope you had a nice time as well. Uh, when you log off, there will be a survey, so uh, please be sure to take that. All right, and I hope to see you all again next week. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Amos and PFI.